30 seconds of, of background about me. Uh, my name is Chelsea Collier. As Jay mentioned, I'm the founder of DigiCity, which is a platform that's focused on smart cities, but very specifically on how smart city technology can address civic and social challenges. So I'm very much focused on technology, not just as a matter of ones and zeros, but how does it make our life better and how can we improve our urban environments and our communities as a result of that technology. So the word smart city uh, for the past four years has gotten some play in the US, of course, around the world, both in Asia and Europe. Um, they're a little bit ahead of us, but we are gaining quickly. So lots of different, different definitions of what the word smart means when we're talking about smart cities and smart technology. This is one that I pulled from our very own um, um, uh, OSCA, which is the, the new um, Austin City, uh, for those of you who were familiar with the, with the previous organization. Um, same mission, which is to bring people together for the city of Austin. So this is basically the smart city organization brings all the different stakeholders together. So I borrowed this definition from this organization, which is basically, and I know you all can read, but the term smart cities refers to the application of digital technologies, data collection, analytics, and modeling by a city and affiliated organizations through the use of IoT devices, the joining and strengthening of existing digital tools, smart city technology leverages data to improve resource management and strengthen contact between citizens, residents, and government. So that is a lot of words and they're all very um, accurate, but at the end of the day, what is this and why does this really matter? I like to make things very simple. With DigiCity, our self-appointed role is basically to bring all of these different sectors together so that we can um, enhance problem solving in our community. So in the simplest terms, a smart city is really the internet of things or IoT, more commonly and, and modernly known as edge computing for the urban environment. So it's all of these connected devices that are deployed throughout our urban environment. And why does this matter? It's all about, and I put in term in parentheses here, ethically, because this piece is critically important and cannot be underscored enough, to ethically collect, manage, and share data and inform better decision making in our communities. So that's a lot to take in. Um, I think sometimes a lot of the terms around smart cities gets confused. It's, it's easy to kind of think of anything that's related to technology is smart city. Well, not necessarily. So here's a little cheat sheet um, that I created that basically breaks down the three essential elements of a smart city. First and foremost, you have to have connectivity and you have to have devices that are connected to each other and to um, a, a method of, of exchanging information. So, you know, a device, whether you're talking about a camera, a sensor, a mobile phone, it has to be enabled with some level of internet connection for information exchange. And that's where the term the edge comes in. So I put a little um, note here for Wi-Fi 6 and 5G. This is the next generation of connectivity. Today, you know, we all live in a 4G world, but 5G is deploying throughout many cities in the US and even smart cities in, in Texas. So connectivity and connected, connected devices, of course, check that box. And then the most important part is data. So unless that device is, ex unless they are exchanging and generating information, those devices deliver, deliver limited value unless there's a data play. So if there's not some sort of data being crunched, some sort of analytics being created, then it's not really a smart city either. And then one of the most important parts is that there has to be a civic application. You can definitely have connectivity and connected devices and lots of data being collected and managed and shared. But if it's not integrated with the public sector, with the city, with the government, then it's just simply private sector IoT or edge computing or uh, device at the edge or connected buildings, all things that are very cool. But to be a smart city, you have to have a civic application involved. So if this is probably creating a lot more questions than it is answering, and that is okay. Um, I think this is a really rich place for exploration and questions and debate. So I hope that you all will take some notes and then challenge some of this as we go forward. So again, why does it matter? You know, a lot of people like to talk about smart cities and get lost in technology, but at the end of the day, it's all about solving problems for people. So what are those benefits specifically? Number one, to save resources. 
So you're providing services more effectively and with greater efficiency. This is super important, obviously, in the pandemic when lots of government budgets are getting constrained, especially at the city level. So they're having to do more with less. Number two, increasing equity. You know, thankfully, um, city of Austin pays a lot of attention. And this guides a lot of the decisions that are made on our local level. And data can support that. So the data collected from those devices, if you think through that, that um, one one, two, three, three benefit or three um, kind of components of a smart city, that data can help create transparency about access and then promote civic, civic problem solving. When you know what you're dealing with in real time, then you can make better decisions and serve everyone in the community, especially those who are the most vulnerable of our neighbors. And then last but not least, promoting prosperity. So this is about creating opportunity, which sometimes is in the private sector and industry can benefit from a smart city, but it's also about improving the quality of life for citizens and residents. So thinking about how this translates and how it maps to different use cases, Rob has an awesome presentation. He's really gonna go into depth and get into more of the technical piece of this. I just pulled a couple of really high level examples that illustrate some of these concepts that I've talked about so far. So safety, and you know, in the short term, it can be about first responders, let's say firefighters. They can respond faster and be better informed because they have data in real time and information prior to arriving on the scene. Then when they're on the scene, perhaps they have some sort of mapping that helps them navigate a burning building. Um, in the longer term, you can take all of the historical data that you've gathered from all of these devices and inform things like smart lighting. So if there's specific um, levels of crime that are happening in one area of the city, you can perhaps make better budget decisions about deploying lighting or different, um, different pathways to increase safety in that specific area of the city, and then you measure it, and then you can create better decisions going forward as well. Um, in terms of health, you know, obviously COVID is changing all of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis and for the long term. And what's really important is understanding, you know, where are COVID outbreaks? Should I go to this part of the city? Should I go down to a park? Is it safe? Well, if you have information about where there are COVID outbreaks, you can heat map that, you can show it in real time, you can see if there's lots of density, and you can see that as it's happening. And the longer term, then I'll share an example later on about a city who's doing this, you can sync that data with healthcare providers and then inform a better response and how to better communicate with the public. And again, these are really quick use cases. I know I'm flying through this um, the, and these are just, you know, very high level, simple use cases. There are literally hundreds that live just within each of these little categories. And then a mobility, you know, obviously we want to optimize traffic and get from A to Z as quickly and efficiently and safely as possible. But we can also use smart technology to enhance our user journey. So if you're going from one end of the city to another, you want to take a bus, you might need a scooter to get to the place where you want to go, where the bus drops off. Well, if all of those things are connected and, and those um, devices are all collecting data that can inform your journey, then you get a holistic view of what options that you have and you can make smarter decisions in real time. And there's all sorts of savings that can happen on the public side public sector side too. Longer term, you know, mobility in terms of smart cities, the real potential is on around autonomous vehicle testing, which is its own presentation in itself. So again, lots to think about and talk about here and hope that you'll have lots of questions afterwards. So thinking about all those different benefits, and I know this slide is hard to read. It's actually not meant to be read. It's meant to overwhelm you <laughs> because creating a smart city as a platform is a really complex undertaking. And if you think about mobility and safety, um, the connectivity piece, smart buildings, um, basically any sort of information that you need to help inform how a city can operate more efficiently, that is a smart city and connecting all of these different um, areas is no small feat, but we are on our way. 
So in order to do this, again, it's less about the technology. The technology already exists, and there are lots of brilliant people, even just within our own city, who can put a lot of these things to work. But it doesn't work if one sector is doing it alone. Industry can't do it alone. It obviously has to interact with government. But government doesn't have to do it alone, because there are lots of different creative ways to figure out how to deploy some of this stuff. And when you are creating the different solutions, you really have to have everyone involved. That means our social sector, our nonprofit, and our community advocates, creative and artists, they have such an important part to play in designing a smart city. Of course, academia, lots of our higher education institutions, um, and even high schools, lots of cool ideas coming from high school students. I know we have at least one on the presentation here tonight, which is awesome. And obviously, entrepreneurs and startups are such a place of innovation and can really Really spur ideas that any one of these sectors working alone wouldn't necessarily come up with and of course residents at the center. So as different cities think about their smart city plans, it is absolutely critical to have at least one um, one representative from each of these sectors at the table. When the, when the decision making gets siloed, that's when things start to get pretty challenging. So this is my hope for the way that Austin will prepare its smart city journey. So obviously we're experiencing this in real time. Change is the new normal. You know, when I had this on a slide six months ago, I didn't know how quickly that we would be moving into this space. But I think that smart cities and the potential when it is um, ethically and, and responsibly integrated into how we work and live and play and, and move throughout our lives can really help us anticipate and mitigate some of the risk and the challenge that we're feeling because we at least know what's happening in our city in real time. Time, which can inform our own personal decisions and then the decisions of our elected leaders as well. So this is a big Big slides. This could be its own presentations, but state and local governments and how they're implementing smart city technology um, is, is a real. So everyone's trying to figure out how to move into a place of, of um, non-crisis related to COVID, how to support uh, workers working from home, how to implement social distancing and help people understand what's safe um, and just really doing that in a very challenging business environment with lots of fiscal constraints. Um, everyone's trying to figure out how to move into the next place and in order to do that we have to be adaptive, we have to be flexible, and we have to be accountable to each other and having the information um, from all of these connected devices within a smart city then helps us live in a place of transparency. That's the great hope of a smart city. So just wrapping up, and then um, Rob will take it from here, but you know, I think the great hope is that maybe data can save us, but again, it's not about the technology at the end of the day. We have to learn how to think differently. We have to learn how to work together differently so we can apply all of this technology and do so in a way that supports the next iteration of our communities. So, Rob, I know you have a lot of really good um, drill down in terms of the technical piece of this and how you implement some of the things that I've given a high level overview for. Wonderful. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, I'll go ahead and share as well. Um, that was a great introduction, Chelsea. I think some of the key things that I got out of that, and hopefully our audience did as well, is why do it? And what are the benefits? Why should you try to look for technologies that can improve the way a city operates? Uh, whether that improve transportation, improve public health, improve public safety. These are the reasons to start looking at, you know, why do a, a smart city project? Why do a smart city strategy? Um, as introduced before, my name is Rob Silverberg. Um, I am the Smart Cities Lead for Dell Technologies for North America. I've been focused on the smart city space for about the last four and a half, five years. Been with Dell Technologies for, gosh, 17 years, so a long time. Um, and our, our focus in this space, we call it digital communities. And we call it that for a reason. Uh, first of all, because a lot of the technologies are around digital transformation, digitally transforming of the way a city operates. And then communities, because whether it's a digital city, a digital county, potentially a digital state agency, all of these levels of government have a play in implementing uh, digital transformation technologies. 
So as I move forward here, as you highlighted before, there's, there's many different potential focus areas that technology can be used to uh, improve the way a city operates, whether that's environment and utility, economic growth, citizen engagement, mobility. That one came up in a couple of the uh, improvements. I even donated one uh, around reducing trip time, reducing traffic and congestion, improving transport and public safety, uh, an initiative nationwide called Vision Zero that can potentially reduce and eliminate traffic accidents and fatalities. Uh, a lot of focus around public safety, making our cities uh, safer and uh, more efficient. And lastly, digital government is around uh, essentially that transparency, that ability to share information, to share data, to share dashboards and encourage the community to join in uh, both the citizen engagement side and the digital government side in terms of how a city interacts with its uh, community. So I pulled this slide out, uh, it comes from a group called IoT Analytics. Uh, and I thought it was interesting because you can look at the various categories of the top 10 smart city use cases. And essentially these are the percentage of cities that have fully or partially deployed the use case as part of their smart city initiative. Uh, they looked at about approximately 50 cities across the globe. So you'll see that connected public transport, traffic monitoring and management are a key area of focus globally. Uh, in many areas, uh, flood monitoring, water level monitoring uh, for the environment, uh, video surveillance and analytics. Uh, this is what we'll talk about uh, a little bit today, how video surveillance is becoming um, changing, it's evolving from recording what happened to actually having real-time insights and analytics that power dashboards and alerts. Things like connected street lights, water monitoring, air quality, pollution monitoring. These are some of the smart city technologies that are being deployed currently. So in order to deploy technologies in a way that makes them effective, we're seeing a, another transitional move from where everything used to be in a data center to having to embrace the edge and embrace the, uh, that intersection or that venue or that park. And the ability to start moving those intelligent resources, the compute resources closer to the edge. So part of this strategy that we're gonna go through and some examples that we'll show you around how you can start moving those advanced analytics, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, out closer to the venue that's being monitored, whether that's a park or an intersection. There's also uh, the concept of cloud, uh, the ability to potentially have elastic compute resources, whether that's in the data center, whether that's in a public cloud or a private cloud, that ability to rapidly scale up and down. But I think the key message in this slide is that compute resources are moving out into the, to the edge environment. And the reason for that is um, specific technologies are enabling those sort of distributed architectures. So if you think about the two sides of this, uh, of this new artificial intelligence that we're working with, there's deep learning, uh, which is one type of artificial intelligence. The most common use of this is something called computer vision, where a computer is essentially analyzing a video stream and looking for specific things, whether it's counting cars, uh, anomaly detection, or potentially identifying uh, public safety uh, concerns. And then the other side of that coin is machine learning. This is the ability to aggregate data over time and then start to develop predictive models so that based on X number of days, years, or months worth of data, you can start to become predictive and know what is likely to occur given uh, the machine learning algorithm and those predictive models. So the key part to this is that uh, AI is becoming uh, a key part of many city smart city strategy from the computer vision operating at the edge to those machine learning and predictive models operating in their data center or in the cloud. This is sort of the layering approach uh, around how Dell sees this sort of strategy. The first piece is you've got to have that core, flexible, secure IT infrastructure uh, that allows you to deploy these sorts of solutions very rapidly, uh, leveraging um, um, a virtualized data center environment Key to this strategy, of course, is cybersecurity. Any smart city initiative needs to operate within a secure uh, environment. 
The main other, uh, the main next piece to understand is how do you deploy those devices? How do you manage devices, whether it's a camera or a microphone or a sensor out in the field? You need to have a way to manage that from a central command and control plane. So there's a number of different capabilities around managing these remote devices uh, because having to send someone out to, uh, to, to, uh, to, what's the right way to say, updating a device is something that is not really doable at scale. So if you start thinking about hundreds or thousands of connected devices, you do need that ability to manage that uh, IoT platform. The second major part of a smart city strategy, we believe, is a data platform. Essentially, the ability to ingest data that is being gathered from these edge devices from other data sources, and then turn those, uh, turn that data into actionable intelligence and to, uh, I would say, real use cases. Uh, usually cities will start with dashboards, visualizations, and alerts that is interpreting the new IoT connected devices that are becoming the eyes and ears of the city and helping the city to understand what is happening in real time, whether that be traffic patterns, public safety incidents, or other. And then you can start talking about some of the more advanced capabilities such as data science, data integration, the ability to create data-driven applications and potentially data as a service, data as an API. I'm gonna go into an example that showcases some of these capabilities. It's a project that uh, Dell Technologies teamed up with a large systems integrator called NTT uh, and did a project for the city of Las Vegas uh, called Accelerating, uh, Accelerate Smart. And the use cases that we initially agreed with the city to deploy were crowd counting and sound detection, wrong direction vehicle movement, to persons of interest and vehicles of interest, and vehicle count for traffic congestion and patterns. So you can see that some of these use cases could be very valuable for the city's ability to both understand what's happening as well as leverage that new data stream for greater intelligence. What the city wanted to see is they wanted to see an actionable dashboard. The primary goals the city communicated to us and to NTT was uh, prior, uh, prioritize quality for license plate and crowd data control, focus on telling good stories with data, capitalizing on areas covered by existing network and infrastructure. And what it looked like was uh, 32 cameras, 25 license plate recognition, seven crowd counting cameras, five gunshot audio analytics in crowded areas, and five glass breaking audio analytics in traffic and parked car areas. So you can see with both video and sound analytics, you can gain a lot of insights, essentially the eyes and ears of the city, leveraging those advanced artificial intelligence tools to alert the city to what's happening. So one of the use cases was around traffic incident uh, reduction. The city had had a number of accidents at, at various intersections where vehicles were turning the wrong way. So they decided to start monitoring those intersections to see how bad was the problem and what could they do about it. This is an example of an alert being uh, created because the vehicle is turning the wrong way um, and potentially could cause an accident. So the city thought they had a problem with this intersection, but they didn't know how bad the problem was. They thought they had one or two uh, instances a day, but actually there's more like 10 to 15 times a day where a vehicle would turn the wrong way and potentially create a, a, a dangerous situation. So uh, with that, the city can then use that actionable intelligence to make changes and measure the effects of those changes. So they initially put some additional signage uh, in the intersection, you know, left turn only, but they found that it wasn't enough. Uh, looking at the statistics that were being gathered by this system, it reduced it from 10 to 15 a day, only down to say eight to 10 a day. Uh, so with that information, they realized they needed to do that next step. And they painted the big one way, one -way arrows in the intersection. Uh, in order so that a driver, when, when they approach the intersection, will see these big arrows and very clearly be uh, uh, aware that, that, that you can only turn that, that way. And, and after that second step, they, they got it down to the level that they wanted to, which was uh, very few per day. Vehicle recognition is a new part of AI, again, edge computing, edge intelligence. And what it can do is not only identify a license plate, which has been around for a long, long time, but also potentially the year make and model of a vehicle. So if we look at, or maybe not year always, but sometimes, uh, here we have a red Mitsubishi Outlander. So the ability to have a, a monitoring system that allows you to find all red Mitsubishi Outlanders uh, could be very valuable in the, in the event that you're looking for a stolen vehicle or you're looking for a vehicle that may have uh, been involved in a criminal incident. 
So again, it's that ability to go to that next level using that artificial intelligence. So crowd counting is very interesting as well um, for two reasons. One, uh, knowing when crowds are going to be in a certain location uh, could be good for resource planning and economic development. A good example is if you happen to know that a certain street corner has a, a high amount of pedestrian traffic between 8 and 10 in the morning, maybe the city can then use that to attract a coffee house to that location. Or maybe another area of the city has a high uh, no, amount of people in it in the afternoon, and maybe that's a good place for uh, an ice cream parlor or Jamba Juice. The other thing that's interesting is around the predictive models and how the predictive models, if you gather this data over time, you can then use it for uh, anomaly detection and identifying when things are not as they normally are. So this is a, an example of crowd counting. Uh, the location is called the Fremont Street Experience. If anyone's been to downtown Las Vegas, you realize that this is a, an area that the city's trying to attract more people to come to and they have bands and they have events and they have other things. So the ability to measure how many people they're able to draw is very important to that business community. So I mentioned anomaly detection. So the system can start to predict how many people will be in a given area based on historical data. And the more data you have, the better the predictive models. So you look at this chart and you'll see that the red is the actual values and the blue is the, the values of the number of people in the venue predicted by the model. So maybe on a Tuesday night, you have an abnormally large crowd in the area, more than normal. Maybe that band was extra good. And we wanna bring them back on a Saturday night. Or maybe in a park, we normally on a Tuesday afternoon in this park only have five to 10 people in the park and suddenly there's 100 people in the park. Well, the system will then flag that as an anomaly, alert the city to the fact that there, there's a, a 100 people in this park and the city can then look at a quick video clip to try to understand what's happening in that park and whether resources need to be deployed. So these, these are showing that two types of artificial intelligence that are very important. One is the edge analytics to start gathering that data. And then there's the machine learning and the big data analytics to start using that data to be more predictive and the ability to detect anomalies. Uh, so in looking at how you create an edge architecture, how you create a smart platform, the NTT team worked with uh, Dell Technologies as well as with the customer to create a smart platform. And what that smart platform is capable of doing is ingesting those IoT data streams from virtually any sensor, both structured and unstructured data from, from non-IoT sources. And uh, essentially it's that platform approach, which I talked about earlier in the presentation, that enables multiple use cases on top of the same platform. So instead of going and building a smart safety solution or a smart transportation solution or a smart environment solution, you're layering those use cases on top of the same smart platform. That platform has the ability to do those edge analytics. It has the ability to do those predictive models and essentially becomes a big data management system and analytics engine. So if you look at how the technology is actually deployed, and this is a what you need to understand if you're really looking at this from a technology perspective, you start with a, your street or venue and you have your various sensors that are deployed to monitor that street. Then you have two types of analytics that are running. The first one is running close to the edge in something called a micro data center. And in that micro data center, you can actually bring in multiple sensor streams and have those advanced analytics running in close proximity to where the cameras are. This eliminates the need to bring all that uh, I would say high density video and audio back to a central uh, data center. So you're processing that data closer to the edge. So sensor control and the ability to do those analytics. Then what you do is you feed that resulting data. So instead of it being video that's coming back, it's actually data that's coming back into your big data platform in your central data center and in, in the cloud environment. And you start leveraging that data for those predictive analytics using machine learning, using those tools to then give you that predictive model. And then we also mentioned the need for uh, uh, managing your IoT environment from a central command and control plane. And that piece of it is called the multi-orchestrator multi and the ability to potentially monitor, manage, update, and control those edge devices from a central command and control plane. So uh, this is what is deployed, this is what is being used, and this is what Dell and NTT are promoting to other cities across the nation. If you look at a very specific use case, we also have partnerships uh, with, from Dell Technologies with NVIDIA. 
And NVIDIA has done a lot of work in the smart city space. Their smart city platform is called Metropolis. And what it does is it leverages um, a, a core deep learning algorithm and then trains it to identify specific use cases. So I'm gonna see if this is going to work, but we're gonna try to get a, a real time play of what it looks like when it is doing those analytics in real time. So here's the uh, deep vision uh, traffic management module running on the NVIDIA Metropolis platform. And what it's doing is it's doing uh, year make and model identification. It can identify trucks and other types of vehicles. You can identify potentially when a truck is parked and blocking traffic. These are the sorts of traffic management things that this tool set can do. So looking at these use cases, I think traffic monitoring and management and anomaly detection are very, very interesting smart city use cases. There is a, uh, a city here in the San Francisco area that we are working with to do anomaly detection in the context of Vision Zero. So can we identify when a vehicle is not doing what it's supposed to do, when a vehicle is running a red light, when a vehicle is in a bike lane, when a bike is in, in the street, when a pedestrian is crossing the street and not in a crosswalk, the idea being we're starting to gather new data that will help the city to understand the root cause of accidents, the root cause of fatalities, and hopefully then take steps to mitigate. The way it works is pretty simple uh, from a technology standpoint. You've got your existing cameras that are monitoring intersections in the city. You're then feeding those video streams into the, uh, the uh, a server, server environment that has that analytics uh, AI on it. Uh, again, it's it's basically the NVIDIA Metropolis platform. The, the training of it for specific use cases was done by uh, the Deep Vision AI team and is running on um, Dell Technologies infrastructure. So if you look at sort of this from a strategic point of view and you're thinking about smart cities holistically, right now what you have is a lot of silos around the city. So you've got public transit and mobility and gas and, and waste and police, and each one has their own data sets, their own dashboards. But if you start to think about this as a connected ecosystem, and you start looking at ways you can start to look across these silos, start connecting data, analyzing data, creating those dashboards and communications to allow uh, both the city leadership as well as the community to better understand what's happening. That's what changes these things from garbage to smart garbage, from water to smart water. It's that data-driven data analytics layer that improves efficiencies and improves the ability for the city to operate. We also don't think that cities should, should go after uh, technology for technology's sake. When we first started with the smart city, uh, I would say, uh, mission, it was really about experiments with technology, but I think where we've evolved to over the past four or five years is really the ability to solve problems with technology. Again, we've seen some examples of public safety, traffic management, potentially smart lighting, but the, the key are the benefits to the citizens in the city. And of course, if you layer, if you use a platform approach as opposed to a one-off, you build that foundation for future projects. So as you start looking strategically again at what smart city means to the city of Austin, you look at all these different smart city initiatives, but you layer them on top of both a platform approach, a strategic holistic view, and then you deliver those results step by step. Uh, the other last thing I'll say is it's a partnership um, from the technology vendors to the city leadership to the community with everyone having the combined goal of improving the way the city operates and uh, solving problems for the city. So that's what I have for you today. I hope you found that interesting and, uh, and not too techie, but I uh, wanted to make sure we delighted the techies in the room as well. And if we need to do a follow-up and go deeper, we can do that. Thanks so much, Rob. I really love a, a bunch of your slides. Um, I think you do a great job of illustrating just how complex all of this is. Um, and I'm really appreciating too the questions in the chat. I've been looking at some of this discussion in the Q&A. I think your questions are really good. Um, I know we're gonna have a Q&A portion, but I'm gonna try to incorporate some of the things that are coming up, the issues that are coming up in my next slides, um, which is just examples of cities who are really doing great work. Um, I didn't include Austin and that's not a, a slight to Austin. It's simply um, these cities are really working 
working um, and has some very tangible results. So I'm always happy to share with what's happening outside of our city. So uh, one second, see if I can share my screen again. And now present, okay, great. There we go. Okay, Houston, our neighbor just right down the way. So recently, um, Houston was written up in Forbes as using the pandemic as an opportunity to build a resilient, smart city. So what did they do and what did they do well? Well, it turns out that they've been investing in smart city infrastructure for about 10 years. And that's really the piece of it where they had a leg up from some of the other cities in the US is because they already had a strategy in place. And just Jesse Bounds is the director of um, Smart Cities, the director of innovation within Mayor Turner's office. And they've been working on this both within their office and across all the different sectors um, and departments within the city, which is just in itself <laughs> quite a challenging feat, as I'm sure as the, as some of the folks in the public sector on the call today or tonight can attest to. Um, but then they don't stop there. They reach outside of City Hall and they work with industry. They work with startups, a group called the ION um, is a new startup accelerator right in the middle of downtown Houston. And they've all been working together, collaborating together, um, facing challenges together. And they look at technology as an enabler and not necessarily as the end all. And Rob, I know you alluded to that, and I think it's a really great point. And one of the questions um, that I saw pop up, which is around the, the whole idea of IoT and sensors and cameras collecting all of this data, it's very easy to go to the place where you think, oof, you know, Big Brother's watching. All of this IoT is the opposite of enabling innovation in cities, but it's actually not true. The technology is the enabler. Um, and, you know, a smart city and how a smart city is implemented in any municipality is a reflection of the people who are putting it to work. So it's a reflection of the policies. It's a reflection of the policy of the um, of the politics. It's a reflection of how that community works together. Those things are much more full in terms of how a smart city becomes and evolves rather than the technology. The technology is simply cameras and devices collecting data, creating insights, and how that is used separates which cities win and which cities struggle. So um, very proud of the work that Houston is doing. They continuously put people and their challenges at the center. And they've had a bit of practice. You know, they're, um, when Hurricane Harvey hit, you know, they got to work and they just had to roll up sleeves and really get busy. So fast forward to pandemic, they already have disaster response experience. And so they're able to use some of that experience to inform how they're focusing on disaster relief. Um, and they really look to their entrepreneur community to help solve problems. So, you know, um, really encourage you to look at this article in, in Forbes. It's um, not that old, it's about a month old, so it should be easy to find. But they go into a lot of detail in terms of some of the examples that we were talking about earlier, you know, how they work with their medical community and they were able to understand where COVID was having its outbreaks. They were able to measure COVID and detect met detect COVID in, in the water system and then warn people and, and be able to address the resources in order to um, start to start to fix some of those things. So um, it's one of the questions too that came up that is really, really good, which is how do we make sure that smart city technology and strategies are applied to all residents, not just those in the wealthiest zip codes. And this is a perfect example, is when you can take a digital snapshot of what's happening in your community, then you can deploy resources to help everyone in the community and perhaps even um, concentrate resources where folks are having the greatest level of vulnerability. So this is one example, Houston, um, a really, really good one. Um, next slide, Orlando. So Orlando is such an interesting community because they define their audience not as just an incredibly dessert diverse, but also their visitors. So they're, you know, struggling in terms of um, travel and tourism being affected because of COVID. And so they know that they have to uniquely serve their community. Um, their uh, CTO, Rosa Octavia, 
Mukta Kavari, um, and they're also uh, Director of Sustainability, Chris Castro, work very closely together across all of the different departments. And when I talked to Chris and Rosa a couple years ago, they said, this is where we're spending most of our time. We're learning how to work together. We're learning how to think differently. We're learning how to share resources and incentivize our different departments to work together. And then you can apply the technology layer, and then you can understand what data everybody needs in order to make better decisions within the community. So they were very committed to their smart city strategy. And I think this is something um, that we can take in our city as a real lesson is to really do the work and have a smart city strategy in place that is not just created in City Hall, but is co-created with the community. And if you think back to um, the ecosystem, we need all of those or representatives from all of those different sectors at the table to co-create that strategy. It is not up to one sector. So I will probably say that 10 million times <laughs> in the next 30 days, but I cannot emphasize how absolutely important that is. Um, and when you do that, then you can look at the vast amounts of data that everyone is collecting in public sector, private sector, academic startups, and then use that data to inform appropriate action. So, you know, that can be pushing data from the, oh, and the example that they did in Orlando is that they actually took data from uh, the state of Florida and then pushed that out to the edge to their first responders. And they were able to inform the police, fire, EMS as they were going into high COVID areas, um, how to protect themselves, how to be warned, how to help other people understand um, what they needed to do to protect themselves and, and their loved ones as well. And then they were able to take it to the next step and aggregated all of that information which then told them where PPE was needed the most and where they needed to push um, some of those resources from PPE to testing locations, all sorts of digital signage involved, and all of that is updated in real time. And then at the very end, that data is also informing leadership and the public about what they need to know in order to keep the community safe. So um, there's a, a webinar coming up and I'll, I'll mention it towards the end uh, where Rosa goes into more detail about all of these things and just the work that they're, they're doing is, is a real inspiration. And then finally, our friends in Georgia at Curiosity Lab in Peachtree Corners. This is right outside of Atlanta. Um, and towards the bottom, you'll see things like the AV test track, video surveillance, of course, everything powered by 5G, lots of great testing labs happening there. And all of this technology is basically informing how to invite the world to come down and co-create solutions within this living laboratory. So they're very focused on autonomous vehicles. Um, there's a test track there. And then um, there's an innovation center within the technology park where people live and where they're working. And what's really important and another um, really critical part that I hope that we adopt in Austin is that there is uh, streamlining between all of the different policy pieces, you know, when you're thinking about inviting academics and universities, um, whether they're startups or global companies, all sorts of industry to come in and innovate in your city, there's lots of challenges around who owns what piece of the physical infrastructure from roads to sidewalks to right of way and streamlining all of that and making it easy. Um, of course, with the appropriate regulations and policies in place, but at least, you know, having a very clear and transparent way around what is encouraged and what is allowed um, and, and what problems you're trying to solve is, is really critical. And I think Curiosity Lab is doing a really nice job of, of setting some of the ground work there. So those are just three very quick um, solutions or quick examples. You know, at the end of the day, a smart city is all about connection, collaboration, and co-creation. If you take nothing else from all of this great information that Rob and I are sharing with you, I hope that you will take those three words away. Again, there's very little to do with the technology application there. Yes, super important, but it's how people work together and how we are incentivized to solve problems in our community that is really at the heart of what a smart city can be.
community. So in terms of next steps, please get involved. Austin Forum is such an awesome platform to bring people together from people who probably would never even heard of a smart city to people who are subject matter experts um, and can really get in, in the weeds in terms of the technology application. So the next step is take it to the next step. Uh, smart Cities Connect is a conference that's coming up October 27th through the 29th. Usually we are all together and there's several thousand city leaders and um, industry leaders, academics and, and startup founders coming together. But of course, this year we're doing that virtually. So please plug in there. Um, our very own Aust Austin Smart City Alliance. Um, this is the local organization that is the convener around all the different sectors to solve problems for smart cities in Austin. Really important group and really laying the, the foundation for how Austin will evolve as a smart city. And then I welcome you all to check out DigiCity. Um, DigiCity, everything on there is free, all sorts of resources, articles. I basically curate everything that I think is interesting and the most human-centered applications of smart cities. So please read, share, and enjoy. And now I think we're going to take some questions. Is that right, Jay and Jessica? Yes. Yes, it is. Sorry, I was busy trying to get my uh, unmute on. So yes, um, the, the plan yeah, you were now- pouring whiskey, let's be honest, come on. <laughs> the, the plan now is to take some questions and sell, until 725. Okay. We have uh, some, and I, I will pick the questions because we have more, and we'll pick them in an order that I think addresses the content you had tonight. And we normally do this part by the moderator asking questions, closing the meeting at 730, and then coming back for extended Q&A where we promote people. But I think that we can just go ahead and promote people for the first part of Q&A, close it, we'll have a few minutes of closing at 730, and then continue to promote them. Jessica, does that work for you? I think that's a great idea. I was going to suggest that. All right. So let me, um, I'm gonna share two slides first to emphasize a couple of points that uh, Chelsea made. And I wanna make sure you have the information for it. So one is about the Austin Smart City Alliance. I saw a couple, well, actually I saw several questions for which I think the answers are almost present weekly in our Austin Smart City Alliance discussions, email threads, newsletters, monthly member meetings and so on. So I hope some of you will check that out. The URL is www.austinsmartcity.org. This is a, the organization that Chelsea just mentioned. It used to be called Austin City Up. And then we realized nobody knew what it was from that name. So it only took me four years to get around to changing the name to something more explicit. Um, it really is a smart city alliance. It has people from the city of Austin people from industry and private sector, tech companies, services companies, and just other companies that care about smart cities approaches. It has higher ed, it has governmental organizations, it has, it has nonprofit associations, and it has many individuals who just care about smart cities. There were many comments made in the chat window about uh, it can't be just a private sector solution. Likewise, it can't be just a government solution because it's tech companies that make some of the technologies needed. It really needs to be a team effort. And that's why we created the Austin Smart City Alliance. That's why we made sure that it has stake uh, members from every stakeholder group and even the board of directors for it comprises people from every stakeholder group. It hosts many free public events. Membership is cheap, but uh, a lot of the events in this are free and open to everyone. So we hope you'll check that out. One other event coming up, it's coming up in eight days. It's the Texas Smart City Summit. There will be speakers from the city of Austin, the city of Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and potentially other cities, counties, and communities. We're still collecting possibilities for the showcase session on cities, counties, and communities in that. So it's an all day uh, summit. Uh, it's absolutely free. You can log in for the portions you want. The agenda is mostly fixed, but little bits of it will change over the remaining days of this week. We hope that you will check that out as well. It's a good free source to learn much more about smart cities and to meet other people in the state and see applications of smart cities. So with that, I am going to Oops, let's go to this. We'll go to the Q&A now for Chelsea and Rob, and I will start to pick a few questions. And actually, we'll go with the first one. Jessica, you want to promote Craig? Yes, I will promote Craig. Hold on. Let me 
Oh, Craig Wheeler. Hold on. Sorry. It takes a little. Craig, there you are. The questions and points are really good, by the way. I'm just appreciative to everyone who's tuning in and thanks for the for caring. <laughs> I think yeah. the, they're right, they're spot on in terms of what we should be concerned about and thinking about in smart cities. Craig should be rejoining right now. We'll see. Craig, oh, don't breathe. Take yourself off mute, Craig. Wait, no, we can't hear you. You're still on mute. Oh, there you go. Perfect. I got, I got thrown off, had to come back on again. So I had asked my question in the in the question box, and Chelsea basically addressed it with those you know, very nice summaries of what Orlando and other people are doing to get the people and the policies out first. But as in so many of us, uh, you know, it's got to be the right people and the right policies. And uh, so I'll, I will cross my fingers, but I'll certainly read the article. And, and Chelsea, I think that was fine. But I, I guess a little more discussion uh, from either one of you of how, how do we, I, Chelsea, you're kind of asking this, but how do we get the ethics up front to mm -hmm. make sure how do we even define what the ethics is? I, I, I know that's a, that's a huge topic and I don't expect to completely resolve it, but yeah. uh, a little more uh, addressing the ethics. Well, Jay, uh, Jay was texting me on the side about how Chicago people are collecting the data and then throwing away the pictures of you. And I'm sitting there looking at people taking pictures of my car and yeah. registering my license plate. And I, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of great things to happen we just yeah. have to keep an eye on the how it might get out of control. Right. That's not really a question. It's a free-floating anxiety. Thank you. It's the topic of our time. I, I mean, <laughs> I wish I could pull out my magic wand and say, bling, this is absolutely the answer. But the, the real answer is that it's complex and it's an evolving conversation. And that conversation cannot be had by a few. <laughs> so another one of my favorite cities who's really taking it step by step is the city of New Orleans and involving citizens and, and residents in New Orleans who have very low digital literacy how do you make sure that you can make smart cities relevant to them and how do you engage them in the conversation about how their data is collected how it's being used to help them create a safer city and um, Whitney and in, in the um, smart city I think it's the technology office um, did a really cool program where they basically went into underserved neighborhoods with the folding table and said, we will fix your smartphone for free. And they worked with one of the local universities and brought lots of folks who were, you know, trained in how to do this, but needed some practical application. And they use that, you know, they're fixing like mobile phone screens and they use that as an opportunity to create a conversation about technology with the community. And then for different communities who perhaps were, you know, in the downtown area and lots of tech companies, it's a completely different way of having that conversation. But they looked across all of the different spans of their community and said, we have to start this conversation. We need people's input. What is the best way to do that? Meet people where they are and invite them into the conversation. It's not, let's bake a strategy and then throw it in front of everybody and hope nobody screams about it. So it's really just about being intentional as, as leaders. I can add a quick comment to that. Um, some of the policies around privacy uh, are very important and making sure that whatever technology is implemented conforms to those policies. And I agree with Chelsea that those policies are under development and it takes a community to put them together. But um, if you think about a camera as being an optical sensor, and that optical sensor is really only gathering data, anonymized data, then that's new insights for the city in terms of traffic patterns, traffic flow, some of those data aspects of smart city that are not invading privacy. So I think the important thing is, A, we need the policies, we need to protect privacy, but we can also do it in an anonymized data mode if we choose. I, it's not anonymous in China. That's true. Which is why we wish the whole facial recognition thing is a, I mean, so I, I, I hear what you're saying, but whoa, 
But that's a perfect example, you know, very different system of government, very different um, tolerance in terms of how technology is implemented. And I actually did my Eisenhower Fellowship in Smart Cities in China. So I'd love to have a side conversation with you about that because I, I learned a lot during that trip. So one of the things I, I would like to add to that is anytime you're collecting data at the edge computationally, there is the potential to obscure that data at the edge computationally. So the potential is there. As Chelsea and Rob are saying, it really comes down to working with the community, working with lawmakers, making sure people understand ramifications and enacting regulations and, and ordinances and laws that prevent the abuse of it. But you've got, if, if you're collecting data digitally, you have the potential to immediately encrypt that data obscure that data, et cetera. Any facial recognition detection algorithm can be used to obscure the face because it had to recognize where a face was and can then be used to obscure that face. Now, how people choose to use it, as Craig brought up in China, can be you know, of, of, of ways that maybe we wouldn't agree with here. But then it becomes, as Chelsea was saying, a policy issue and several people in chat pointed out the need for community engagement. So the, the I'm going to ask you guys for final comments and read uh, two or three questions on this that are related rather than doing a bunch of related ones individually. John Cobb says, Rob, interesting, the architecture you described did not present how it handled policy enforcement, i.e. metropolitan resolutions barring facial recognition or open records requirements. Um, I saw one from Amy actually, what about privacy and building trust in the community? to apply these technologies? Can someone address that? And Becky said, what is the most effective mechanism to integrate a community's concerns around privacy, autonomy, et cetera, into the tech development process? So all three of those questions related to community engagement, community trust, and policies that protect the community. Any, any final comments on those? Chelsea, you wanna go first? You don't need to go. Sure. I just didn't want to hog uh, going first, so <laughs> I'll jump in and talk about this all night long. Um, you know, I think that the role of um, Austin Smart Cities Alliance is really, really important here because, you know, it's um, we all want to create communities that are more engaged, more connected, and, and more reflective of the community that we want to see. How you do that is actually quite difficult. <laughs> and if you don't think it's difficult, just try it. But getting all these different sectors together to even have the shared language, that in and of itself is a real challenge. So groups like Austin Smart City Alliance, that's their whole reason for being. And they have the structures and the mechanisms and meetings, and, and it is their our job to bring all of that together. So I think the conversation starts there. And, you know, in every single community, um, maybe not every community has, you know, kind of a, a third party nonprofit convener smart cities um, organization, but many do, especially in, in some of the, the more, um, the larger met metropolitan areas, that's exactly what they do. And they take very different forms and they may have different priorities, um, but it's, it's their job to be that whole Holding container for the, the community-wide conversation. So um, if all of you are as passionate um, as you seem to be in terms of how engaged you are with your questions, get involved and bring in people who don't even know what a smart city is. You know, this is really important. It can't just be up to the techies and to, you know, a handful of people in city government. A smart city is for everyone if we let it. And so our job is to invite as many people into the process as possible. Great. So we're going to take one more question now, then close the meet, the formal part of the meeting or make our final announcements, I should say, and then do extended Q&A until eight. So I encourage you, if your question has not been asked yet, do not give up. We will answer it between 7.30 and eight. If you have a question you haven't asked yet, you still have plenty of time because we'll be here till eight for extended Q&A. So type it in the Q&A function. For the last question before we make our final announcements, however, I'm gonna pick this question by Miko. So can we promote Miko to live? Okay, promoting him. Thank you so much, Craig. 
move Craig back down. All right, Miko, you're live. Hi, thanks so much for this great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all your comments. You want to yes. ask your question? Sure. Um, my question, for some reason, isn't loading, but it was basically just what were the what are lessons that Austin can learn from the two cities that you talked about to move forward smart city policy? Miko, I was actually referring to your other question. Uh, mm -hmm. How do we make sure that these smart cities are inclusive, where it benefits all of the residents and not just a few? Because the answer to the question, you, your other question is gonna be answered in the Texas Smart City Summit next week when Houston shares those lessons for everybody. Yeah, as you go to that. Uh, so I was gonna, so how about, you wanna ask the one about making sure it's inclusive of all? Yeah, so how do we make sure that our smart cities are inclusive of all of its residents? Yeah. Sorry. Rob, you wanna go first? I'm happy to take it, or what do you think? Um, gosh, I, I will say that, how do you make it inclusive? Um, there's a lot of talk these days about digital divide, about, the need for cities to make sure that. Oops, Rob. Rob, we lost your audio. <laughs> wow, that's weird. Automatically muted me or somebody wow. <laughs> they were saying the wrong thing. But I think uh, most cities that, that we're working with understand there are issues with digital equity and digital divide. And they want to make sure that whatever technologies are being deployed, they help solve that problem whether that be connectivity, whether that be devices for remote work in school, I think it's, it's a key part of most cities' strategy is to bridge that divide. Yeah, I can, I'm so glad you brought up digital divide because it's obviously you know front and center for everyone across the US. Um, the way that I think you make a city more inclusive is you invite the organizations and the individuals who have dedicated their lives and their missions towards equity and inclusion in the city of Austin. They have a place and a seat at the table when we're designing a smart city. And if they don't, we need to add a seat and we need to broaden that table. Um, a lot of times smart cities are technologists and, and government, so it's private sector and it's, and, it's, and it's public sector, but we have a whole community out there with deep expertise who have the answers and you know we have all the technology. I think we have all the wisdom in our community. We just have to circle up and again, that's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's easy to say, but finding common language and finding common um, kind of ways of, of working to, together where everyone's incentivized to work together is actually quite challenging. So, but the first step is saying, hey, there's nobody representing equity in the city of Austin at our smart city conversation. Let's change that and make sure that that sector is invited and encouraged. So it's all of our jobs. Great, thanks Rob and Chelsea. Okay, um, everybody stay tuned. Jessica and I have a few final announcements and then we'll get back to Q&A. So let me share this screen with you. I wanna remind every, first of all, thanks again for joining us tonight. I wanna to remind you that we have some great events coming up to close out the year. Two weeks from tonight, AI and the Future of Work on October 20th. In about four weeks, we have quantum computing with our good friend Worley, one of the pioneers in this space. Uh, an event on online worlds and the future of gaming on November 17th. And that will not just be gaming for entertainment, although that industry is blowing up during the pandemic. It will be how we can use gaming technologies in education, in workforce development, and in other areas as well, and for staying connected. Uh, we have Tech for Social Good on December 1st. And then as always now, we start the year off with the tech trends for 2021 and beyond. So we hope you'll join us for these events. Um, we also encourage you to join our Slack workspace. As Jessica mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, it's really easy to do. Go to our website, there's a button to join it. It's a way that we can carry on some of these conversations between the meetings. Uh, again, we wanna thank all of our wonderful sponsors. They really make this happen. Uh, they make it possible for us to hold these events. Uh, you'll notice several of our sponsors are technology companies that I assure you care deeply about the smart city space and have programs and positions dedicated to that. Others are Austin companies that care deeply about Austin itself. And I saw several references to, to old Austin and new Austin. There are Austin companies that are sponsors here 
Uh, they care about old Austin, but they're trying to make sure that the Austin Forum can help usher in that new Austin in an equitable, approachable way. So that's why these events are offered and why they're free for everyone to bring people together and share that information. And finally, uh, we're a couple of comments on the digital divide. Um, the Austin Forum cares deeply about people being able to connect. Even when our, our events were in person, we collected devices uh, for families in need so that they would have devices recognizing that most of the things they were doing the, in their lives were online. Now we're online as well. We're continuing to support uh, Housing Authority of City of Austin's program called Austin Pathways. We have, um, thanks to you, our attendees, we have collected a hun uh, uh, hundreds of devices, over 300 devices over the last few years for this great program. Now, of course, we don't meet in person, but there's information right here on this slide, or you can just go to their website, austinpathways.org, and they will arrange to pick up your device, clean it off, and repurpose it, uh, repurpose it for people in need. So if you've got extra devices, if you're planning to upgrade to that Galaxy 12 or iPhone 12 or whatever the latest and greatest is, or you have an old laptop somewhere, please let us repurpose it to people who can use it. Um, help share the upcoming events. And uh, with that, Jessica has, oops, sorry, didn't mean to start it yet. Jessica has her final question for the night. You're on mute, Jessica. We still have quite a few people on tonight. So I wanna hear from you before we get into more question and answer. Right in the chat, everybody wrote so many great ideas for what futuristic tech thing you'd like to see in Austin. But right in the chat right now, what was the most useful, helpful thing that you learned or heard tonight? So what was useful, what was interesting, what was helpful? So we'd love to hear. We know we, there's still some people, 50, 47 people still in the chat and still chatting it up. Um, so we would love to hear if you please share. I think everybody's already grabbing their drinks. <laughs> That's on the next slide, actually, but yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, you didn't even start your timer, Jay. Oh, sorry, 30 seconds. Okay. Usually, I know. I was typing my answer to your question. Wow, mm. thank you. <laughs> As you should. NTT Architecture Bus, I thought that was really fascinating too. I've seen that a few times. Hearing about the digital divide. That's, oh, very interesting, Marcus. We're glad you can learn, hear new things. Jay, we're waiting for your answer. Oh, Orlando Smart City efforts that account for visitors and tourists. People-centered practices. And hey, Amy, we're really excited. Amy is one of our fantastic board members. We're thrilled awesome. to have her on. So continue to share things too. And um, please continue, be please stick around because we'll have an opportunity to ask more questions and engage with Chelsea and Rob. Gaining perspective on the ecosystem. So take two, less than two minutes uh, however long it takes for Jay to walk back to his whiskey bar that we've all been watching and come right back. That's basically how long this two minutes is. For all of us, it takes longer to walk that far. Cheers. Yeah, I know. Mine is my Topo Chico. I'll be back. <laughs> Let's see, Marcus Lewis sent a message to the panelists. Are you aware of similar programs in Georgia? Marcus, Chelsea probably is. And Rob, are you doing any work in Georgia? Uh, uh, sure. right. we, we are helping the city of Atlanta with some of its initiatives. Uh, but if you're talking about organizations that are focused on collaboration for smart cities, I think Chelsea would know better. We have a lot of questions in the Q&A, so I hope you all are ready. Uh, I'm ready. Hey, can I give a shout out for a book I'm reading right now? Yes. So I think um, one of the challenges, and it's kind of intimidating around smart cities, um, is that it is such a, a technology driven conversation. But this book has been very helpful to me. Um, it's called The Fuzzy and the Techie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> about I just read this. Yeah, how liberal arts will rule the digital world. So um, yeah, David Judson recommended this. Um, he's with Urban i which is a very cool um, online blog about or online publication about um, what's happening in Austin. So recommend you read the book and recommend you check them out too. 
So they just like really they, while you were away. Like that book too. If there was a similar group to the Austin Forum in Georgia. Um, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a statewide one. Um, there is one in Atlanta. I can't remember what it's called, but I will look for it. Um, and you can dive into Curi Curiosity Lab in Peachtree Corners, Georgia, and they welcome everyone. You don't have to be a company. You can just basically plug in and say that you're interested. Um, the ION at the in the city of Houston is another one, um, and it's very focused around startups and innovation. It's such a and they will be at Texas thing. Smart City Summit also, yeah. including some of their amazing uh, companies that they've been incubating. Yeah. It's Very so excited. cool to see that happening in Texas. Really excited about it. All right, let's take some more questions. Um, we've had several questions about mm -hmm. ethics and fairness and compliance and stuff. So let's take a nerdier question. Uh, Brad Engler, you want to promote Brad? Gladly. He deserves it. Oh, Brad's not on right now. Oh, I I'm, gonna, was very good. I'm gonna ask a question for him and I bet this one's probably gonna be more Brad, for Rob. Brad McCarty's on though, if you wanna promote Brad, any, any old Brad. <laughs> <laughs> any Brad will do, Brad uh, McCarty. Brad Angler, one of our board members asked a question. What is an example of quote, unstructured data from non IOT devices? And I assume this one was probably directed at Rob sort of towards the middle of his presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say unstructured data primarily is images, video, audio. Um, so if you think about unstructured data and the ability to translate those into data, um, most of them would obviously come from a connected device, a video. But, but think about a photograph, for example, uh, and a photograph that you're looking to analyze in some way. Uh, you could either have a person look through photographs and, and identify what's happening, or potentially you could have a deep learning algorithm that looks at a photograph and determines what's happening. So uh, the, the question is a great one. Uh, what is unstructured data? What can you do with it? And if it's not coming from an IoT device, um, what's the value, I guess? I don't know, but that, that's my short answer. Yeah, I'll add a little bit to that one myself. Um, so Rob said very well, video is unstructured data. The data is really just zeros and ones representing each of the pixels. And so until something like machine learning is applied to it to begin or human tagging is done to it, it remains unstructured data. And then humans can tag that data and all of you have contributed to that at some point when you've tried to log into a site and it presented you with a tile of images and said, please click on the boxes that have trees in them. What you were actually doing was applying structure to unstructured data by tagging that data. Um, there were, you were training machine learning algorithms to do that themselves. So m one of the very uh, important capabilities of machine learning and especially deep learning algorithms is automatically tagging and marking up unstructured data so that it has more value for those kinds of things. Um, okay, let's take another question here. Um, Marcus Lewis asked a great question. So can we promote him? Is he still on? He is, and he's here. See, it pays to be here to hang out with us on a Tuesday night. Uh, Marcus, just promoting him. He'll, he'll show up in two seconds. Marcus, you, you're, if you're on camera, we'd love to see you or definitely take yourself off mute so you can chat with, our, with Robin and Chelsea. Oh, wow. I, I just wasn't sure which question uh, you were oh. looking at. I was looking at the which, uh, which industries might resist IoT collections, and you say you were thinking specifically about the resistance of police to document their activities. Yeah, yeah, because um, over the past, say, half decade or more, um, there have been solutions to uh, 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 misconduct. And uh, it seems that the unions and individual, individuals within the industry have been using their own constitutional right to privacy on the job to uh, resist such structures. So there might be other industries, it seems, where uh, they would resist, where people in that those other industries or this industry would resist uh, collection. Yeah. I think that is such a thoughtful question and obviously really relevant to our time. And 
with all of the you know issues um, that we're addressing right now, it's because of connected technology and we're able to record things on mobile phones and share that through social media that some level of accountability is hopefully taking place, not in every community, but in many communities. And it's a it's a really good example of you know if if um, first responders and police are wearing video cams and and dash cams and they turn them off and other people are around and that is that is captured on video then that spurs a conversation around if we have this connected technology why is it not being applied across the board and that invites the next level of conversation around how we as members of our community want that technology to be applied so i know it's it's really complex it is never a straight line no matter what we're talking about and i think we kind of hunger for for one answer to every challenge um and i just don't think that is ever going to be the case for anything going forward it's going to be complex it's going to be evolving and that's why i keep harping on this we have to have everyone participating in the conversation it can't just be reserved for a special few and i don't know if that really answers the question but it's something i think a lot about and invite your thoughts around that too well i do uh, I, I do like the idea of uh, greater accessibility, uh, public accessibility, like open data, yeah. um, so that it's not just the government, it's not just corporations, but anybody who knows how to use it mm -hmm. might be able to uh, uh, analyze and create dashboards uh, and offer different interpretations of the numbers. Mm -hmm. But I think that a problem might come about that might, well, those who collect the data have authority over the data mm -hmm. and they'll use their, you know, say uh, their power over uh, uh, servers, server space, mm -hmm. their power over collections policy or whatnot, um, you know, any of those things that might just spin. Uh, I don't know how one would get around yeah. that kind of uh, self-interested activity. Constant communication and community engagement. Mm. It's, it's really the only answer. There's no, there's no real rule that can be applied. And if it makes you feel better and Rob and, and Jay, you certainly can talk about this from a technology perspective, um, really deeply and, um, and thoughtfully, but the whole sector is moving to an open, transparent, converged, um, more more modular way of applying technology. And I've been doing a lot of research and, and work in the connected building space. And it used to be that you would just go to one vendor and then that one vendor would basically dictate how that technology was, imp was implemented. But now it's really being mandated that it's there is a platform and then you can just plug all of these different applications and technologies and approaches within an open system where the data is then converged. So that's starting to shift on the industry side. And I think it's going to really impact how we as on the community side, um, look at that too. And Rob and Jay, I know you can wax poetic about this um, much deeper than I can. I'll make a couple words and I'll let Jay talk is that uh, the move toward transparency and the move toward open data and the move toward making sure that the government entity is being transparent is, is definitely, um, I would say, on the increase, uh, as Chelsea also said. But then you also get some questions about what is the policy around, for example, police body camera video? Uh, is that something that gets released? Is that something that is kept private? Is that something that gets released in certain conditions? So there's a lot of policy questions that your question is right on target in terms of what do we do with that? We now have collected police body camera video. What, what do we do with it? And how do we make sure it's transparent and open? Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm the technologist that's going to say, again, the answer is not always technology, but technology is not always to blame either. The technology capabilities are absolutely there to collect data. They're there, in Marcus's case, you can make sure that the data is shared at multiple locations, so it's not under one person's authority, but that multiple copies are in different people's hands. It's, as Chelsea said, it's a question of constant communication, community engagement, educating your policymakers and making sure they and you're voting for people that will enact policies that you agree with and that they're educated about the issues sufficiently to do it. 
the challenge here is not whether the technologies can be made to be the appropriate tool. Smart cities technologies are not different than other technologies that can be abused and can be regulated as well to, be, to prevent the abuse while maintaining the good benefits. The problem, of course, with any technology is the rate of technology uh, capability increase is exponential, but time passes for all of us linearly. So there'll be entirely new capabilities tomorrow and people won't have learned the technologies well enough from yesterday to enact good uh, ordinances and laws without what Chelsea said. Constant communication, evaluation, discussion, assessment, and then making sure that your policymakers and, and, and lawmakers are part of those discussions are listening. And if they're not, that you don't vote for them, right? It's, yeah, it's well, you got, you got to vote for people that care about enough about the technology pluses and minuses to make good policies. Yeah, I think I'd call that the Iron Man problem to <laughs> be a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> From a really important perspective, I talked with a city recently that was interested in whether there was an artificial intelligence algorithm that could go through their several years worth of body cam video and identify when an officer draws his weapon and identify the ethnicity of who it's drawn upon. And they want to see if there's a difference in how often an officer draws their weapon against one ethnicity versus another. So it's, it's an interesting topic that you bring up. Well, there, what you could do is chip the guns as well, right? And the chip would have an accelerometer and just like your smartphone, it can recognize the act of being pulled, basically. It's a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty easy technology solution for determining whether it's drawn. The video then can provide the assessment of who it was drawn against, as well as providing that record of the circumstances. Um, I'm gonna move on. Clark asked a great question here. <laughs> Um, Clark asks, how are smart cities dealing with disaster response? Can they reroute traffic or section off safe sections of the city? Um, Clark, is he still here? It looks like he is. Good. Sometimes. Sorry. So I just would expand on that. Yeah. Hi. I was just curious, you know, like in times of, you know, like in Louisiana now, when there's a huge hurricane or something coming through, how do, you know, cities deal with rerouting traffic, figuring out where people go. It seems like there's a lot of room for, you know, data that kind of step in there. Yeah, and I'll step in here because I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana. I was born in Houston, so I can claim native Texan, but I spent all of my formative years running from hurricanes in Louisiana. So a lot of experience here, and you're exactly right. I mean, um, it's actually a really good smart city case study because in a natural disaster, a local municipality is absolutely forced to work with the state. It is forced to work with the feds. So FEMA gets involved, all the different federal agencies get involved. They all have to share data, well, they don't have to, but um, ideally they learn how to share data in real time that is still has the privacy and, and ethics um, pieces in, in place. So people are, are um, their, their um, you know, identity is, is scrubbed in a way that they can be identified if there's a challenge, but not identified for nefarious uses. And all sorts of things, you know, contra flow, you're able to, with the right digital signage in place, start to move traffic. You're sparse, you can do alerts very differently. I spent some time uh, a couple months ago in New Orleans, right in the middle of a big tropical storm that thank goodness didn't turn into a hurricane but the level of information that they were able to push out and geolocate and geofence based on different areas of the city that were potentially going to flood was really awesome. And Kim LeGrew is the chief information officer for the city of New Orleans, and she and her team spend just incredible amount of time and effort really thinking through that. And even the smaller municipalities, um, they work really well regionally where, you know, New Orleans may, um, 
be implementing a pilot or doing something and then they'll share those learnings with with other cities so a lot of that work is happening and i think it's really rich for our, for exploration um, but again you know kind of looking at the houston example because they had to learn the lessons about how to work together across all those different sectors and apply technology because of hurricane harvey now they're better prepared in the age of of COVID and the pandemic so um natural disaster and and pandemic response go hand in hand. Can I add, add one to that? Um, some of the things that, that, that I've seen, especially in the, the Southeast area and the hurricane belt, as you call it, is the ability to accurately predict when you're going to have a flooding condition. So right. stormwater sensors, uh, rainwater analysis, you know, rivers rising at a certain rate, the ability to have the appropriate sensors and information flowing to the city to accurately say, we are going to have a flooding condition in one hour or in three hours or whatever that might be. So they can take the appropriate precautions or alert the right communities. And the second one is the ability to potentially model what uh, a certain flooding condition will do. Uh, a, a city that's in the news is, is Miami that has created something called a digital twin that allows them to say, if we have this much water and it's gonna hit our downtown, which areas are going to flood? So with those two things, predictive models to say, we're likely to have a flooding condition. And two, these are the areas of the city that will be affected. The ability for them to proactively move people out of those regions, move vehicles, those sorts of things, improve their, their disaster response. I think the whole concept of a digital twin is so cool. <laughs> I would love to see that put to work in Austin. And again, when you say the word digital twin, most people go, oh, it's just too expensive, but there are ways to fund it. You have to probably get a little creative. The first one I saw was in Singapore. And of course, you know, they just funded it, <laughs> but we're in a very different situation than Singapore is, but there's so many learnings that can come out of that, you know, simulated environment um, that I think it more than, than pays for um, its use. We just have to figure out how to how to get those working and designed in cities. Great, thank you both, love the talks. Thank you. All right, um, thanks Clark for your question. Uh, Roy Truitt, are you still online? Mm -hmm. Jessica, can we promote Roy? Nope, Roy's not online, so I'll ask his question. Roy Truitt submitted, China's social credit system is really scary. All that is needed is info on citizens' behavior, and they have control. Much of what we are talking about provides that info. Then the question of trust in government and those holding the info becomes paramount. Not really a question, but worth addressing China's social credit system as it relates to smart city technologies. Any thoughts on that? All right, I'll dive into this one. Dive in. uh, I think, um, you know, I am not a China apologist, um, but I will say spending a month on fellowship focused on smart cities in China, again, this was four and a half years ago, was really eye-opening in terms of the Western lens that we bring in terms of judging how their system operates. And again, I'm not saying that all the headlines that we read here in the U.S. should be excused. I, I, I don't even want to get into that piece. I think that's that's a, a much bigger topic for discussion. But when you're looking at things like social credit, it's it's a very quick term and, and way of, of um, kind of describing those things. But then when you apply them to what we're, we can do here in the U.S., which is driving behavior and the ability to get a discount on your auto insurance, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's the same sort of principle that data collected on your behavior can result in different treatments. Now, that can be a positive treatment. That can be a negative treatment. The positive treatment is you save money on your auto insurance. Negative treatment is obviously a very long list of social injustices. So I think one of the big takeaways that I'm having from this discussion is that technology is technology and people and people are people. And the application of that technology and how people enact that technology is what makes the difference. So, you know, I don't think I'm asking, I'm answering Roy's non-question, but um, I think it is really, really complex. And just to assign like, this is good and this is bad, uh, it, I think ignores the complexity behind the technology. 
Chelsea, that was a great example. I've never heard anyone use the lower your car insurance premiums in a response to the social credit question, but I it's really- It's a simple one, but it's applicable, right? It's incredibly powerful, and that reminds us all, and I'm not apologizing for any negative behaviors, but we have cultural differences in where we draw that line between the appropriate use of data and technology and the inappropriate use of data and technology. And whereas we would mostly all agree that, that murder is bad and that certain other things are good, that, that cultural difference determines exactly where in the gray it transitions. And so I, I love that answer. I, I'm, I'm going to steal that from you. I love that one. When one of the things that I think we are just really challenged as a society with, and this has nothing to do with smart cities, or maybe it does, is that we, we are rewarded by very extroverted short-term activity. How we tweet, how many likes, how many this, what gets shared. But the challenges that we are all faced with, the challenges of our time are not flashy they're not short very complex they're very long term and we have to invite different perspectives at the table maybe that we vehemently disagree with so we just won't move at this at the right pace in my opinion if we polarize black and white yes no right wrong we have to get comfortable with complexity and not knowing it's so much more powerful to show up in a community and say i don't know the answer to this question but here is my concern and then zip it and listen. <laughs> so I hope, I hope that um, Austin can, can really do that and, and be an example to the rest of the country on how to do that, particularly related to smart cities. And let me say that there are a lot of cities that are uh, banning facial recognition. And yeah. could that be in response to what they see from other sure. countries like China, perhaps? Yeah. Um, other cities are, are, in it, it, are doing similar things. For example, one city has a policy that although they can put up cameras, they can't record any video. So the video is only being used for an analytic or a monitoring, but not ever stored. So it's those sorts of policies that the community needs to make sure their elected officials understand, their city leadership understands. And that's why, I guess that's why this type of forum exists. Yeah. Exactly right. So I have a question that I'm going to tack on to that, Rob, for you and Chelsea, and I'd like to know where you stand on this. When San Francisco famously announced that they were going to ban facial recognition, while, by the way, not actually having a working facial recognition system at the time anyway, so an easy ban to make, yeah. I remember thinking to myself, well, someone commits a crime, if they have a picture, they circulate the picture in the community to help find that person who committed some allegedly heinous crime, or they ask the uh, witnesses and victims of the crime to provide information if there's no photograph or for a police sketch, and they circulate the sketch. And we've accepted these behaviors of posting pictures of people that are wanted, posting police sketches of people that are wanted. So how do we have that accepted for so long and then decide facial recognition as a means of, of, of being more effective at finding the bad guy is wrong. Why can't we just uh, scrub all the faces except for the positive hits in facial recognition and then have appropriate policies in place for interviewing the suspect who may be innocent, just as we already do? Why ban facial recognition as a re better replacement for the police sketch or the police photograph? How do we solve that problem? I'm gonna let Chelsea go first. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I don't think that it's a technology problem. It's an understanding problem. And people will reject what they don't know. And they will fear what they don't understand. So when I saw that came across, um, you know, the headlines, I guess, I guess it was like a year ago, year and a half ago, my immediate reaction was, oof, I'm I'm a little sad about what this is going to mean for entrepreneurs in the area who are innovating with this technology, who, who are like thinking of possible use cases for the social good. And then I thought, mm, okay, I get it. Um, people are scared. They don't understand. And in that, elected officials feel responsible to basically hit pause, which is not necessarily a bad thing. What I hope is happening, and I don't know if it is or if it's not, 
is that you hit pause and then you hit the streets and you start educating people about this is what this technology is. Here's what we do with this data. Here's how it's secured. Here's how it's shared. Here's how it can make our community safer. What does everyone think about that? And what other possible use cases could we use? And I think your comparison is a very good one. Why are we more comfortable with this, you know, black and white printed pictures of people plastered all across the city, as opposed to the technology solution? And then just have the community conversation and listen to what people hear, listen to what people say. Um, and I think once you have that kind of data, then you can move forward with informed community co-created policy. And you might get to the same place. Everyone might say, we don't care, we're not comfortable, it doesn't matter, and that's what you do. But at least you're coming from an informed perspective as opposed to a knee-jerk reaction, you know, kind of, um, uh, I don't know, quick hit perspective, which I, I get it, but I, I don't think it really gets us any further in the conversation. I don't think I can do anything better than that, so thank you. <laughs> All right, I am gonna give the final, that was a great answer, I love that, Chelsea. Um, I'm gonna give the final question of the night to Phil Boyer. Uh, Phil, are you still on? He's not still on, so I will Questions paraphrase the question because it's the perfect ending question. Yeah. Which is considering digital divide and appropriate tricky public transparency and other factors, what do you all consider the top two to three smart quadrant next opportunities for Austin, Texas? And we're all part of the Austin Smart City Alliance. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we all have our, our, our thoughts on this. Yeah. Well, I let Chelsea go first last time. So um, I'll, I'll go first on this one. I think it comes down to identifying what's the top priority problem in Austin and how you can solve it with technology. Uh, I'm not from Austin, so I don't know the problems as well as you do, but I, I go there a lot because Dell has their headquarters nearby and the traffic is horrible. So um, I don't well, know. If, <laughs> oh, it was, right. Well, it, it still has back. its moments on I-35. <laughs> so it comes down to identifying the problems you're trying to solve and then identifying if there are technologies that can help solve that problem. So I think it's a problem prioritization question. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. And I think if you ask a hundred different people in Austin, they will all have different answers to this question. And that is a good thing. So um, I think it's important, um, you know, to look at things like uh, the digital divide. And I think it's, it's such an um, important um, topic right now because we've been talking about digital divide for the last 10 years, this is not a new conversation, but now there's an urgency to it. So now that there's an urgency and people have a shared experience with a shared experience, now you problem solve differently. And now it's kind of catapulted to a priority where before, I don't want to say it wasn't a priority because I, I know our, um, our uh, city staff cares deeply about this. And in fact, um, the, the work that Rondella and her team, John, have done uh, with Tara in the city of Austin is award-winning digital divide and digital inclusion work. So I encourage you to go to that section of um, the city's website. It's called Terra uh, Technology and Regulatory Affairs. I think I got that right. And look for um, digital equity and access. And, and they've done some powerful work there. Um, but at the same time, you know, digital equity is super important to me. And how you solve that, I'm going to sound like a broken record, is you get everyone in the room. And you say, okay, who has what resources? Who's lacking what resources? And you get public and private and nonprofit and academic and social sector all in the room together and have a very transparent conversation. That rarely happens in, in any city. And the only reason that it's happening right now is because the pandemic, the global pandemic and, and COVID is accelerating that conversation. And now it becomes our moral imperative to make sure that we all have a way to participate. And it's just unthinkable that in a global pandemic, people don't have that opportunity. So we have to solve it now. And so therefore we are, um, but creating the list of those challenges, I think, um, needs all of that sense of urgency. And I'm going to use uh, moderator's prerogative and 
contribute a final answer to this one, and then we'll, uh, we'll close the night. And thank you for that great question, Phil. Um, Robin Chelsea said it great, which is, you know, you always want to know what the problem is you're trying to solve and solve the important problems first. And so not every city has all of the same problems. Every city has a COVID problem, has a public health problem right now. Not every city has a mobility problem. Marfa, Texas does not have a mobility problem. Austin, Texas does have a mobility problem. Every city has a workforce employment problem right now as certain sectors are hit. But not every city has a creative arts uh, sustainability problem like Austin, Texas does. And so the answer to your question is a convolution of two factors. What are the problems that affect people and what are the problems that uniquely affect Austin people? One of the ones we really have here is this affordability problem. And that may not seem like a smart city problem at first. Uh, some people would argue it's a problem inherent in capitalism. Some people would argue it's a problem related to our property tax versus income tax laws in the state of Texas and the desirability of living in Austin. But they're not even, it's not even unrelated to the mobility problem, yeah. right? The farther that you have to travel to the job from the place that you can afford, the more you actually contribute to congestion and traffic issues which also then have a second order effect on health issues from cortisol levels being raised for extended periods of time and relate back to that affordability issue of spending a disproportionate percentage of your household income on your mobility solutions, your car payments and gas and maintenance and stuff. So for Austin, I think it's pretty clear that mobility and affordability are greater issues here than in some other cities in Texas and around the US. Whereas uh, resiliency to environmental disaster is fortunately not quite as bad here as in some places, although we do have wildfire, wildfire threats in the counties around Austin and uh, we have severe thunderstorm effects, although a lot of the civil engineering over the last 20 years has mitigated the flood, the flash flood issues of, of that. So, you know, uh, affordability, uh, mobility, uh, workforce development, homelessness. We have 2,500, the last estimate was 2,500 homeless persons in Austin. And that is not larger than some cities, but it's larger than most cities in Texas. And uh, we don't appear to have done, made much progress on that one. And that's another one that maybe there are some smart city solutions for. I'm not sure a lot of those issues are different too, but um, that would be my answer. Chelsea, did I say anything that you disagree with there? No, I think, um, you know, and I think there's some um, agreement around mobility and affordability as being the, the two top priorities. And of course, those intersect to your point well made um, all sorts of different issues from workforce development to uh, land density to um, to homelessness and, you know, all of all of the things, um, and there is some attention and some conversation around mobility and affordability. But I think it's very difficult for most people to understand what it is like to be in someone else's shoes. So we all look at it from our own perspectives about what mobility and affordability means. And you know, someone who's living under the poverty line with a family of four, mobility and affordability means something very, very different than a person in a different socioeconomic category. So I think, again, we just have to move out of this polarized, my way is the right way. And we don't have to design our city around one particular use case. We have to make sure that our city is affordable and our city is navigable for everyone. Um, and, and that requires us kind of leaning in and listening to each other and those solutions as opposed to just rushing together um, with, with the answer of what we think it is. So, yeah.